When one thinks of hell, they will typically take on the imagination of Dante and fall into biblical imagery full of fire and brimstone, torture devices, and whatnot. However, when French philosopher, novelist, playwright, uh, political activist, and so on, Jean-Paul Sartre gave his stage version of hell, he put it on stage and he presented the spectators with something far more terrifying than anything found in the nine circles of the inferno. Well, depending on your perspective. Sartre's one-act play, No Exit, or sometimes titled uh, In Camera, first premiered in 1944 and was published the following year. It was an instant success and, to this day, is still highly discussed in circles ranging from philosophy to theater to psychology. Today, we'll take a look at why it still holds a profound importance in many areas of study and why hell may be a bit closer to our present-day lives than we may want to believe. The one-act play, No Exit, begins with one of the leading characters, Joseph Garçon, being led into a room by a valet. Here, Garçon gives a few remarks uh, in regard to the furniture, that being three couches, and there the valet makes mention of there being no nighttime, no sleep, and no mirrors, which will become more important later on. Garçon quickly showcasing his concern for hygiene, but essentially sits on one of the couches after a failed attempt to get the valet back in the room. And there he waits for whatever it is that comes next. And what comes next is the following two lead characters, Inez Serrano and Estelle uh, Rigaud. When Inez first sees Garçon, she accuses him of being a torturer as that's what one would expect upon entering hell. But Garçon uh, laughs this off, while Inez exposes herself as being the one who is cruel but an honest individual. She states that she knows exactly what a torturer looks like because she's seen herself in a mirror. Finally we get Estelle, who walks in while Garçon has his face in his hands. She tells Garçon not to look up because she believes that he doesn't have a face. However, this of course isn't true. The mistaken identities at the beginning of this play fall into the overall theme which we'll uh, see in a moment. But to continue with this quick rundown before getting into what this all means, Essentially, the three of them are stuck in this room trying to figure each other out, slowly revealing who they believe they are, why they believe they've been sent to this hell, and any attempt to get along fails miserably, while sitting in silence just doesn't seem like something that can happen for very long. Eventually, the truth does come out about all three and why they are there. Garçon was a deserter of war who would have affairs with other women in which his wife knew about, but he would be executed for his crimes uh, during the war. Inez, who has come to terms with her sadism and the cruelty she brought to others on Earth, she seduced her cousin's wife, which ended with her cousin um, getting hit by a tram, while the woman who Inez uh, uh, seduced ends up murdering Inez and commits suicide by turning on the gas and crawling into bed. Estelle married for money and had an affair with a younger man, eventually having a child with him, to which she would later murder. This murder would have the man that she was having an affair so distraught that he would commit suicide by shooting himself in the face. After all this is revealed, they then try to figure out why it is the three of them were put together. From the start, it is clear that each of them act as the torturer for the other. Garçon seeks approval from Inez, who sees him for what he is, a coward while Estelle seeks the attention of uh, Garçon. It doesn't matter if Estelle feels a real attraction to him, she just needs from him the feeling of adoration, whereas Inez feels an attraction for Estelle that is not communal. This all leads to an unbearable interaction to which Garçon eventually utters the famous line, Hell is other people. Now, to understand what this is all about, and why it is considered to be a masterpiece of French theater, we'll have to take a look at some terms that are consequential to Sartre's existentialism, and show how No Exit implements these notions. 
The first term I'll take a quick look at is the phenomenon Sartre describes as the look, or sometimes called the gaze. To put simply, it is a kind of a pathological response to being looked at by another. This may sound simple enough, but for Sartre's phenomenology, it is the moment in which a consciousness recognizes itself. While gazing outwardly as being the center of its being, but simultaneously as a mere object in the world to a consciousness that gazes back. What is at play is the self-reflective consciousness, which is consciousness being fully realized. In the play, Estelle seems to lose her sense of self when needing a mirror. She makes a few comments uh, showing that she doesn't like to talk to people without knowing what it is other people are seeing. Inez offers to be her mirror, but this only sends her further down a existential crisis. This realization of who Estelle is, is the other, is object reflecting self. No matter how Inez sees Estelle, it is not uh, the person that Estelle is projecting into the world. But is the Estelle that Inez is outwardly gazing upon as other, as object? The constant need for mirrors throughout the play is the characters expressing themselves in a way to try to avoid this look. As we go back to the beginning of the play, where each of the characters upon introduction use the other as a kind of mirror without them even realizing it. Even though Inez does use uh, the mirror as a metaphor for seeing herself in uh, Garçon. However, when Estelle walks into the room, she believes that Garçon didn't have a face. Why? Because without her realizing it, she has her consciousness at the center. And before Garça could gaze back at her, she saw him as the object of her suffering. The man who she caused to commit suicide by blowing his face off. Before Garça could look at her, he mirrored a part of Estelle's consciousness, something only she knew about. The moment he gazed back, she became that mirror to Garça. Inez does the same thing when she believes that Garçon is the torturer. Why? Because that's who she was. By taking away a visual definition of each individual, they are left to be defined by the other. This forces them to understand each other by the accumulation of their past actions. Which leads us to the second important concept that runs through Sartre's work, and that is the notion of bad faith. For one to put themselves in a situation to which they can achieve a level of comfort or to say deaden the responsibility brought on by freedom, one will associate with what Sartre calls uh, bad faith. This is something that Garça and Estelle fall heavily into. So what exactly is it? It is essentially the act in which one will tell themselves a lie in order to mentally escape the responsibility of committing to a decision. And though this too is a decision, it is the lie in which they tell themselves that causes the individual to act in bad faith. Sartre admits in Chapter 2 of Being and Nothingness that this is in fact a normal aspect of life for many people. In fact, it would probably be next to impossible to find someone who has never acted in bad faith. This is not a lie in which one tries simply to deceive another person, but a lie they tell to deceive themselves. A way in which one intentionally or even unintentionally tries to escape freedom of choice, the key word there being tries, by believing that they can escape the ultimate circumstance of uh, making a decision, a comfort ensues believing responsibility has gone with their obligation to freedom. Now what is important to Gersaw is his past decisions, and he knows that these actions are what he's being judged by. What he is trying to avoid is the responsibility and acceptance of his cowardice by telling Inez that he had a more noble reason for deserting the invasion of France. Now the thing is, he very well may have had in mind a more noble reason for deserting war. But the fact is, even if Garçon was morally opposed to war, and was acting in favor of a personal ethical standard, it does not dismiss his cowardice. By Garçon trying to convince Inez that he is not a coward because he held up a moral responsibility, he is lying to himself. 
Not because what he is telling Anez isn't true, but because he's telling himself that if he were to have deserted the war out of a moral obligation, then he couldn't also be a coward. The lie he is telling himself by trying to convince Inez is that these two representations of his character cannot coexist, when indeed they can, and in his case does. By each character trying to convince the other of who it is they want to be to the other, there is no hope for the other to accept them as such, as each one is trying to do the same thing. A competitive subjectivity ensues, and a process of mutual bad faith uh, unravels. Estelle lies to herself being interested in Garçon so that she can feel the attention that she desires, while Garçon feels that he would be relieved of his cowardice if Inez could see him as he projects himself as being a hero. But of course she can't, because who Garçon is, as they all are, is an accumulation of their past actions to the other. So what does the quote that has kind of become a misused cliché, um, hell is other people, mean? Sartre didn't write this as an expression of disdain toward the human race, and being around people is just hell, even though I would certainly agree with that as well. But this statement is more a critique on a key concept that runs throughout Sartre's philosophy, and that is a recognition of an intruding freedom, the freedom of the other. This being something that comes along with the look. When Garçon utters this famous line, he has come to an awareness of the reflective consciousness. He realizes that he is levied to a set of values and principles that are separate to his own, just as much as his own are separate from the other. In this case, Estelle and Anez. Each individual in the room represents a being that is a subtotal of their actions and not their intentions and Garçon cannot change their perception to match his own, and nor can they change theirs. They are to each other what they perceive individually. Sartre borrows heavily from German philosopher Hegel uh, when presenting a particular human behavior, that in which when two or more people are together, their minds are in constant conflict with the other each trying to provoke a perception of themselves onto the other. Each individual, before anything else, desires advocates that would champion the self in which they themselves vision for themselves. The problem is, the other is doing the same. These consistent encounters with the egocentricity of others is what characterizes all human relationships, according to both Sartre and Hegel. None of the three characters in the play identify themselves with their mistakes, and none wants their being to be identified as their actions at the given moment of their weakness. When Sartre said that we are the sum total of our actions, we are, in fact, our choices. The three characters in No Exit have died, and the only remaining existence they left on Earth is held in the other, and the other only sees their choices. Despite the setting being hell, the physical location is not where the suffering takes place. The hopeless suffering of individuals relies in a particular search for a definition of self, given to us by the other and yet one is only brought back to themselves. Understanding that the other is brought to the same fate leaves the individual stuck in the condition of having to define themselves through their decisions. As Sartre says, we are condemned to be free. Now that was a very short introduction to Sartre's uh, No Exit. There is a very important moment in the play in which Garçon actually has the opportunity to leave the room, but does decide against this. But I have a few different ideas on that, and I would actually like to hear what you guys may think the reason that may be in the comments below if you, if you have an idea. But yeah, for now, I guess that's it. And if you do like this kind of content, be sure to hit subscribe as I put one of these out every week. And yeah, hope you join me next time.